I'm going to move this big pulpit out of the way. <clears throat> I don't like be hiding. It's not hiding, but I'd rather be more exposed to, uh, to the audience <clears throat> than being behind the, um, behind the pulpit. One of these days, uh, I like to get one of those transparent ones, those plexiglass pulpits. But then uh, some individuals say, no, I'd rather have the wooden pulpit where I could be a little bit <laughs> behind it. Well, how was everybody's week this week? Did everybody have a good week? Yes, good. You all had a good week? Did every, anybody have a challenging week this week? Any challenges this week? You had a challenging week this week. Okay. Yep. One person had a challenging week. Well, that's pretty good. Denise, you had a challenging week this week. Okay. We have two. See, it just takes one to start it. Now we had another <laughs> with a challenging week. Anybody else with a challenging week this week? Back there, back there. You see, it takes one brave person to start it off, and then everybody else's hands are going up because you're unsure. Well, I don't know if I should admit it or not. Anybody else have a challenging week? Okay. <clears throat> so we had good weeks. We had a challenging week. How many of you have been keeping up on the news? Raise your hands if you've been keeping up on the news. Okay. I think most of us have the things that are happening in our world. <clears throat> um, Last week, last week uh, I talked about the, the things that we have been witnessing in our world today and all of the protests and uh, um, everything that started since May, was it May 25, Memorial Day, was it the 25th? <clears throat> everything that started on May 25th with the death of George Floyd the, by the hands of the police. And uh, things have just, uh, there have been movements and things in our world, and this is worldwide, these protests are worldwide, that um, many of us have never seen in our lives before. <clears throat> I was alive in 1967 uh, when the riots took place in Los Angeles. I was alive, but I don't remember those riots. Some of you may remember the riots in LA. Uh, after the death of Martin Luther King Jr., um, 67, 68, all of the war protests against Vietnam and the thousands of people. Again, I was alive, but I was a kid. I don't remember all of those. <clears throat> um, and uh, <clears throat> some of you re may remember the protest just nine years ago, the Arab Spring. How many of you have seen on news all of those protests from the Arab Spring? Yeah, it started in Tunisia and and uh, uh, Libya and Egypt and all of these countries. Unfortunately, many of those protests that started in these Arab countries, <coughs> excuse me, I don't know, I have something in my throat. Some, many of those protests were <coughs> caused the downfall of some of the, some of the uh, prime ministers and leaders such as in Egypt, uh, Gaddafi in, in uh, Libya, Muammar Gaddafi. But um, those protests, unfortunately, didn't end up procuring what they sought out to, to uh, gain. And that was more of a democratic form of, <coughs> excuse me, of leadership, a democratic form of government. And so in that sense, um, they didn't have much success, unfortunately. And uh, <coughs> most of you remember those protests. Now, of course, now we have these protests. Um, so I started talking about this last week, um, just a really a, a quick recap that has been going on for last, specifically this last week. Um, we've all seen the violence that has taken place, uh, the peaceful protests that have taken place. I would be amiss if I didn't mention that, the peaceful protests, right? And then a minority, I really want to emphasize this, a minority of those protesters have been the ones that have sort of usurped the peaceful protests and have vandalized and have looted. Right here in Arizona, of course, the, um, 
oh, what's that mall called? The Fashion, Fashion Square, is that what it's called? The Fashion Square Mall in Scottsdale, which is now reopened. Uh, you've seen those news where they were just breaking those windows and, and, and breaking through the mall. It's a very beautiful place, by the way, that, that mall. It's now reopened. Um, it was a minority of those that have caused all of this damage. Um, most of the protests have been peaceful. Peaceful, Of course, the news is going to focus on all of the break-ins and all of the graffiti and all of this stuff. Obviously, the news is going to focus on that because you tend to click on those things more and they attract more eyes, which means more ratings, which means more attention, which means you're paying attention to ABC or CBS or all of these other things. You're going to do that because the dogs that bark the loudest get the most attention. I'm not calling anybody dogs, but you're not going to see more, uh, to a, a general degree, more of those peaceful ones. So those protests have been peaceful, um, but they're ongoing around the world. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, bad things happen. Things get out of hand. Setting a, a motorcycle policeman on fire in, in Guadalajara, Mexico. Um, or, uh, you know, or Chaz. You've heard about Chaz lately. Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone in Seattle, uh, Washington. Um, don't tell me you don't know about this, what's going on in Seattle. Um, the, uh, the city officials basically gave up the East Precinct in Seattle, the police precinct, and now there's about six blocks or so uh, that protesters have took over. It's the autonomous zone. I'm not going to show a bunch of videos and photos that I did last week. I've got globs of them, but there was this one sign that said, you are now, you are now, uh, what did it say? You are now exiting the United States of America when you go into this zone. Um, I'm not going to get into politics. Some people are in favor of that. Others are against. But just to inform, that's what's going on in Seattle. I do want to mention this, though, before I go into what I promised you last week, go into the Bible. <clears throat> um, Newark, New Jersey. I know our conference president. He's from New Jersey. He would be proud to, to highlight this. In Newark, New Jersey, there's protests going on, but not one building vandalized. Not one riot happening in Newark, uh, Newark, New Jersey. And uh, I saw the interview with the chief of police, African-American chief of police in, in Newark, and uh, also uh, the mayor in Newark. And they say that the differences that they made is that pre-protest, pre-George Floyd, all, before all of this happened, they were engaged in anti-bias training of the police department, the police officers were engaged in their community, et cetera. And the citizens in Newark have said this, all of this that is happening around the world, the rioting, the, the looting, the, the violence, it is not going to happen to our city. And it's not mainly a cause of an overwhelming police force being there uh, preventing uh, these things from happening, dressed in riot gear, but it was because of the pre-training and the preparation before that took place. And so, you know, uh, a good thing is happening in Newark, New Jersey, which I believe is a model for these other cities uh, to duplicate what they, what they did over there. Um, good news. Sort of opposites. On the opposite sides of, of the country, what happened in Seattle and what's happening in Newark, New Jersey, complete opposites. Complete opposites. To me, that's the way I see it anyway. Um, some people have pointed out that George Floyd's uh, criminal past and using counterfeit bills and having drug substances in his blood on the day he died. Some people will point that out and say that, you know, he was not a hero. Um, that's besides the point because those are facts. Those are facts, uh, what had happened that day when he was arrested. Um, and that is true. But in spite of this, no person should be treated the way he was on that day. And I'm saying this live on YouTube because nobody, regardless of your criminal, should be pressed on like that. And uh, in fact, he was saying, uh, they were saying, well, get up. I, this is something I don't understand. Get up, get up, get up. Well, he had four policemen on him. So nobody deserves to be treated that way. Let me transition into what I think the greatest human protest has been in our world. 
Um, historians may take issue with this, but this is what I believe to be true, that the greatest human protest that changed society and introduced new political, social, and economic freedoms never before seen in the history of the world was the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. That was the greatest protest ever. And the reason why I say that is because many of our individual and societal freedoms um, today are due to the revolution that the reformers started in the 16th century, that a hierarchy should not police your conscience. That's what they were fighting for. A hierarchy, a government should not police your conscience because that is between you and God. A democratic way of governance, free inquiry, and mass publicizing. Now in their day, mass publicizing meant the Gutenberg press, press uh, publishing books. And Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., Martin Luther took advantage of that and there was mass publications of his works that went out all over the place. That was their, uh, that was their social media of the day. The Reformation caused controversy and wars, that's true, but vital change is not easy and always costs. The very fact that in our country today, we can protest and demonstrate peacefully, mind you, we can do that is due to the fact of what the reformers did back in the 16th century and introducing and paving the way for a new government in a new world on these shores. So the very fact that we're seeing these protests is a testament to many countries' constitutional freedoms, which in turn owe their existence to what the Protestant Reformation accomplished. That's how I see history and what the Protestant Reformation did. Does the Bible have anything to say about protest? Now, this is what I promised last week that we would share today what the Bible says. Does the Bible say anything about protesting? Yes or no? Well, it may not use that word protesting. So I'm using that word very loosely, protest. But the Bible has plenty of events and circumstances and situations where people were protesting, either protesting in a negative way, in other words, something against that was good, or protesting something against, uh, protesting against evil. You'll have both sides to this. So, I don't, again, I don't have any slides for you this morning. In fact, uh, we can probably turn that off. Uh, well, you can't turn that off from here. In fact, you see on the top where it says play? Just click that play. No, to your right, over to your right. To your right, honey. Right there. Just click that. We'll, okay, there we go. So does the Bible have anything to say about protest? I want to share some passages with you, and this is in Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6, and I'm just going to read the verses right off of my notes. <clears throat> I'm going to read verses 4 and 5, and then what I want to do this morning is I want to share these things with you, what the Bible says, and then I want to extract some principles from these. Uh, Bible passages and what we can learn today when we want to protest. Now, again, I'm using that word protest loosely because when I say if we're going to protest today, you and I are always protesting every single day. I'm not talking about going out in, in, in mass crowds and holding up signs. I'm not talking about that. And I mentioned this last week. You may protest against your own spouse on his or her opinion on what they're doing or what they did. Or what? Or didn't. Or didn't, <laughs> or didn't do. Children are always protesting against other children, whether it be siblings or whether it's on the playground. I was here first. You get off. I got this, I got this swing first. There's always protesting going on. You may have protested in a very tactful way, and maybe even under your breath against your boss for things that are happening at the workplace. We're protesting all the time. And so they may be little minor things, they may be what we're seeing today, major things, but human beings, we're, we're always in protesting or disagreeing or disputing or debating or arguing or fighting. We all do that. It's constant constant, whether it's in the church or outside of the church. 
we're always we're always engaged in, in something to that effect. Okay, so going back to Daniel chapter six, verses four and five, it says this. <clears throat> then the commissioners and satraps began trying. By the way, satraps were very very wealthy people. This is in Babylon. The commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. But what does the Bible say? They were unable. They could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption in as much as he, referring to Daniel, in as much as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Now this is referring to Daniel. Wouldn't you like to be that kind of person? No, you're impeccable. There's nothing wrong with you. So then these men said, we will not find any ground of accusation against Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. So here you have, and I'll come back to this later as I said, here you have a protest against a good person. Somebody who has a great track record in the administration of the king in the palace. I mean, they, they just cannot find anything, to the, they can't pinpoint anything against Daniel's character. And so these men with, as I'll share this later, I don't, I don't want to get too much ahead of myself, with ulterior motives, we're protesting to the king against that. We'll go into that a little bit more later. Um, in Acts chapter 5, verse 33, <clears throat> Acts chapter 5 and verse 33, I'm going to center myself a little bit more here. The Bible says this, but when they, the Jewish, this is the Jewish uh, religious council. These are the religious leaders, the, the big guys, the important guys, the ones with, you know, all of the PhDs and the degrees, etc. I'm not knocking education, but these are the big religious <laughs> leaders. That's who they were. But when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. This is in reference to the apostles. They wanted to kill these guys. Um, and actually, um, there was progressive animosity against the disciples here. Um, I don't have time to go through this, but first there was an annoyance. They were just annoyed. These religious leaders were annoyed by the apostles teaching and preaching about Jesus Christ in the streets and in the marketplaces, in public. They were annoyed by this. It started with annoyance, and then it uh, resorted to arrest. They were actually arrested, and then they were let go, and then they began to be threatened. This is the third one. They were threatened. Number four, there was jealousy. Of course, jealousy is boiling underneath the surface all this time. And then number five, there was an intent to murder. That was the progressive animosity towards the disciples. That's Acts chapter 5, verse 33. They were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. That is premeditated murder against the apostles for teaching about Jesus. They were protesting, if you will, that word. They were protesting against these men because not only were they preaching about Jesus Christ crucified and he was risen, but by default, the blame and guilt was placed upon them, the religious leaders, because they're the ones that shouted crucify him and they were the they were the leaders with this mob and they influenced this mob almost rioting almost rioting but the roman soldiers made sure they didn't get to that point but they were the leaders of the mob that were demanding to kill jesus and crucify him and they were protesting against the apostles for having this dastardly nerve to preach in the name of jesus that he was resurrected Here's another one in Acts chapter 19. I really like this one because this sort of fits close to uh, what we're seeing today. In Acts chapter 19, starting with verse 23. Acts chapter 19, verse 23. How many of you have ever read the entire book of Acts? You read the, I love that book. One of these days I want to do a whole series on that book. I just, I just, it's an amazing book. 
the book of Acts, chapter 19, starting with verse 23, verse 23, and it says this, About that time there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way, capital W. That's what Christianity was called before people were called Christians. They were first called Christians in the city of Antioch in modern Syria today. Um, they were first called Christians there. Before it was just called the way. In fact, I have a Bible. I used to one called the way. Um, verse 24, for a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis. This is uh, the Greek goddess Diana, otherwise known as Diana. Silver shrines of Artemis was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. You see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a considerable number of people saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours would fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. This was one of the wonders of the city of Ephesus was the temple of Diana or the temple of Artemis. Um, it was just magnificent, a magnificent structure. Verse 28, when they heard this and were filled with rage, they began crying out saying, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with a confusion and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarch uh, Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. And when Paul himself wanted to go into the assembly, the Bible says, the disciples wouldn't let him because they knew that this is just a hot spot. You do not want to go in there. They were trying to protect him. Also, some of the Asiarchs who were friends of his, these were political leaders in Ephesus, uh, the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater. So then some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. And this, they were in danger of rioting. Hundreds and hundreds of people went into the theater, and they were shouting, the Bible says one thing, others were shouting another thing, and it was all started by the silversmith Demetrius and the other tradesmen, why were they protesting against Paul? Why were they protesting against Paul? The crowd quite didn't understand everything that was going on. But as it goes, when you see a large crowd, when you're driving along the freeway and there's red and blue lights flashing and you're driving down the freeway, what do you do? Why do you slow down? You want to look. We all turn into looky-loos when we see red and, and blue uh, lights flashing, don't you? Or when there's a large crowd and you automatically are curious. That's just, you automatically go over there or you, that catches your attention. You want to see what's happening. When you see a large crowd gathering and they start shouting and there's movement and there's tumult going on, that really grabs your attention. You want to know what's going on. And this is exactly what's happening over there. And in fact, some wise guy, a wise man, not a wise guy, but a wise man came and say, hey, let's calm down because we're on the verge of rioting. If that happens, we're going to get the Roman soldiers in here and people are going to start being killed. People are going to start being speared. There's going to be hurt going on. Things are going to be damaged. Things are going to be destroyed. People are going to get hurt. People are going to die. Let's calm down, guys. Because of this protest against Paul. And Paul was, uh, and they're holding them back because Paul wanted to go in there and try and explain things and what was really happening. And I'll go back to why these men started this protest in the first place. As I said, I'll go back. Um, there's other protests that were, um, that seemed to be uh, sort of counterintuitive to what Jesus would do. 
to what Jesus himself would do. I'm reading Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 and 13. Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13. For those of you who are watching, open your Bibles and turn to that text or on your phone. Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13. The Bible says this. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple. And you know what Jesus did? He got a little physical here. He got a little physical, which seems to not be, you know, characteristic of who Jesus is. Because the Bible says, and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. In fact, in one of the other Gospels, this is in Matthew, says that he got some cords together and made a little whip. Now, if I were Jesus, I would have whipped the money changers. Let's just be, <laughs> let's see, what are you guys doing? But he didn't do that. He didn't whip the people. What did he whip? Started whipping the animals. Now that's not abuse. And that's, Jesus isn't just whipping them out of anger. He's like, going, ha, psha, tsh, tsh. that's what he's doing. That's the idea. Tsh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And getting the animals to, to move out of there. And, uh, you know, here's the tables of money changers. And he just, wham, and he just overturns them. Seems like Jesus is, you know, dare I say it, being a little what? The V word? A little bit violent here. At least that's, maybe that's what some people thought. But he wasn't harming anybody. He wasn't defacing church property or buildings. But this is what the Bible says. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a robber's den. I don't think Jesus said it the way I said it. Hey, Jesus is doing this. He says, it's written. This house shall be called the house of prayer, not a robber's den. He was upset. Jesus was upset. And he had good reason to be upset, which I'll get into in a little bit. Here's another one. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, now, this took place a long time ago. If you want to call it a protest, you may use another term, but for the purposes of today's message, I'm calling it a protest. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. This is talking about Noah. And the Bible says, And did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness. Now here it says Noah was a preacher. In Genesis chapter 6, it doesn't necessarily mention that he was a preacher. It mentions that he was a carpenter. He was a builder. He built that big ship. In fact, you go to Nebraska. I can't remember the name of uh, the city in Nebraska that has Noah's Ark, the museum. Uh, we almost, uh, because of the COVID-19, there was going to be a large nationwide Seventh-day Adventist pastors gathering in Nebraska. I can't remember where. In, oh, I'm sorry, in Kentucky. I'm sorry, thank you. In Kentucky, and of course that was all canceled, but not far from where our conven the convention center, Lexington Convention Center, I think in Kentucky, uh, we were going to go to this Noah's Ark. Um, they say it's amazing. You can see it online. It's just absolutely amazing. Life-size Noah's Ark, and it's amusing. You go inside, and it's, it's pretty cool stuff. But uh, Noah's a builder. But it says here in Peter, uh, he was a preacher of righteousness. And then in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, it says, By faith Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world, the Bible says, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Now, you can read that in different ways. Building the ark just by virtue of seeing a big ship and him being a preacher of righteousness that someday the world is going to be destroyed. The world is coming to an end. The world is coming to an end. He actually gave a date. He said 120 years because that's what the Bible says. Somebody comes and starts, the world will end, you know, and such and such will be destroyed on July 15, 2020. 
or July 18 is what they're, some Christians are predicting. You know, you kind of like, oh, I don't know about those dates. But Noah knew in 120 years, the world's going to be destroyed. And he was condemning the crowd of his day, protesting against the evils that were so prevalent in his day and in just people's mindsets and their behaviors and just their way of thinking about society and each other. It was just very violent. And Moses was preaching against these things. He was a protester in favor of justice and equity and fair play and love and compassion and forgiveness and right doing. That's what Noah was in his day. Here's another passage for you. How about God protesting? You ever think of God protesting? Well, I don't know if, honestly, I don't know if this is protesting as much as, as it is. It's protesting as much as it is judgment. Um, because there could be a difference. When you're protesting something, you want to change something, you want to reform something. Here, God is basically saying, uh, you know, this is just my judgment. These are my judgment calls. Um, and uh, that's against the Pharaoh. Do you think it would be correct to say that God was protesting the slavery of his people? Oh, yes. And God raised the man to be a leader, to be the leader of this movement to free the slaves, to free this, these people who are in slavery. And even at that, God's initial judgments, so he, he began to send plagues on the Egyptians during the Pharaoh's day. And God's initial judgments, his plagues were soft. I don't know if you ever caught this, and I'm, I don't want to go into deal about, detail about this, but it's just interesting. If you read about those ten plagues in the book of Exodus that God poured out upon the Egyptians, the first plagues are very soft, what I call soft. Um, in order to soften Pharaoh's heart, like a snake. Well, the Egyptians duplicated the snake. Remember Moses' rod, Aaron's rod turned into snake, and the Egyptians duplicated that. Um, the water turned to blood, which the Egyptians, of course, duplicated. They still had water. They had to dig around the Nile. The Nile was full of blood. But the Egyptians duplicated that, but they had to dig around the Nile. That's what the Bible says. Frogs, which he has dip, the Egyptians duplicated. You think God knew that they would duplicate these things? Of course he did. It's like God's starting out the little things and soft. I kind of take a like, God is protesting to them, but he's still, he's going to start off slow and soft in hopes that the Pharaoh would repent and see the light. Well, obviously that didn't happen. And then, of course, the next one and the next one, gnats. Um, from the gnats on, the Egyptians couldn't duplicate. The gnats, insects, plague on Egyptians' livestock, boils on the Egyptians, hail destroying Egyptian vegetation, locusts eating everything that remained, darkness over Egypt. And finally, the tenth and last one had to do with death of human beings. That was the last plague. I think God was protesting, but at the same time, he was making these very severe... Or, or, or serious judgment calls against those that were enslaving his people and against their gods, by the way. Other mentionables, the prophets uh, protested. What did some of the prophets, many of the prophets, protest against? The prevalent sins of the people, of God's people. I'm not talking about the outsiders from the church. The prophets that God had sent were to reform and correct those on the inside of the church. And of course, you have those stories like Jonah, where God is concerned about other nations as well, about the Assyrians. Jonah wants you to go preach to the Assyrians and tell them that, you know, they're going down the wrong path. And you know the story, you know that story. Cain against Abel, maybe you can call that a protest. <laughs> Reformation unleashed. All right, so let me come to these points that I told you I would have come to. 
Um, I titled this sermon last week and today, The Right Way to Protest. The Right Way to Protest. So I want to share uh, a few things with you, a few points. Number one, if you're going to protest something, again, I use that term loosely because you can, we can say if you're going to disagree with something, if you're going to disagree with something, number one, know what you're disagreeing about. Know what you're protesting. Educate yourself. Don't just say anything and prove to everybody that you're a fool because of the foolish things that you said. <laughs> it's better to be quiet and no. Now, uh, obviously, there's going to be some smaller issues that you're not going to need an hour to think about. Um, the bigger the issue is, like the issues that we're seeing today about injustice and reformation of the police department and racial injustices and uh, you know, the systemic uh, prejudice uh, that is ingrained. I have, you know, I have a book in my office called the, the Color of Law. I went to an ASU event and the author was there and I, I purchased the book and I learned that the author was going to be there and I, you know, I got to go see him. It's called The Color of Law. When I mentioned systemic racism, um, you ought to get this book and read it, The Color of Law. Back in the oh, 40s, uh, post-World War, in the 50s and the 60s, when I mean systemic, it was systemic. Banks, banks, insurance companies, uh, real estate brokers, the real estate field uh, and profession and banks and, and these uh, high institutions were all involved in redlining neighborhoods to keep the term back then, the Negro, to keep the Negro in these neighborhoods, to keep them out of the white neighborhoods. And it was deliberate and purposeful by institutions such as the ones that I mentioned. Local and federal governments. Um, this is systemic. This is very systemic. And uh, in the book talks about these ghettos, the urban centers and the ghettos and the barrios and and how um, the only reason why African Americans are in these places is because they're lazy, they don't want to work, etc. All of that is, that may be true in some cases, just as, as it's true in the cases of whites and Hispanics. There's always going to be that group in any race, Filipinos, any race, where they're going to be lazy and they're not going to want to work and they're going to be no goods and not contribute to life. Um, Iraq, Iran, they're all over the place all over but this book covers some really really good information on how the systemic uh, uh, racism against the african-american you got to get the book the color of law anyways know what you're protesting educate yourself on the issue know why you're there or know what you're going to say with your significant other or somebody well i disagree with this because just just be informed that's a simple one number two Protest for the right reason. Protest for the right reason. An injustice, something criminal, tyranny, um, those are right reasons to protest, wouldn't you think? I mentioned the Protestant Reformation. They were protesting against a religious hierarchy that dictated to you what you should think, how you should go to God, what you should what you should. Uh, believe in this and that. No, all religious organizations do that. Our church does that. We have our, uh, we have our set of beliefs. But the difference in those days was that if you dare go against the church, you were deemed a heretic and therefore worthy of imprisonment or martyrdom or torture, etc. You couldn't think for yourself. You couldn't think for yourself. And the scriptures were deliberately kept from the masses. So that's a big difference. But anyways, injustices, something criminal, something tyrannical, you can protest against rightful punishment or discipline against you for wrongdoing. That's just a crybaby's excuse. And in fact, this is what the Bible says. The Apostle Paul says, if you sorrow, if you experience sorrow, 
because you are being persecuted for the name of Christ, then that's a good sorrow. He says, that's a good thing. The Lord will, the Lord will strengthen you. He will give you joy. That's a good thing. He says, but if you're experiencing the kind of sorrow that's your own fault for wrongdoing, he says, then you're getting what you deserve. It's basically what Paul says. That's true. So protest for the right reason. Don't protest because you did something wrong and now you're suffering the consequences because of your wrongdoing. I would say that protest and that, that ill, that sorrow, that anger is ill-founded because all you have to do is look in the mirror and say, it was my fault. I got what I deserved. So protest or disagree for the right reason. And let me go back to some of these Bible stories that I mentioned now. Noah protested the evils of his day, much like we need to do today. But he combined that very direct preaching and warnings with appeals to people to turn from their ways, not with violence, not with threats, but with heartfelt concern. He was protesting for the right thing and did it the right way. Jesus cleansing the temple. I mentioned that earlier. He protested the fact that a place of worship was turned into a flea market and probably with unjust balances for corrupt profit. In fact, Ellen White brings this out. When Back then, when you bought something, they had these balances and you had a, a, a rock or a stone that was the standard and then your money payments was weighed against that. Well, they were, these corrupt uh, sellers, these vendors would mess with that weight so that they would gain profit for themselves. This angered Jesus. This is why today we even have, you go to a gas station and sometimes you'll see those seals on the gas pump. You ever see those seals? And it says the Department of Seals and something, weights and Department of Weights and Measures, because they go there and they have to make sure that those gas pumps are correctly calibrated so that you're paying just prices for the gas. You ever do that when I'm, I do that sometimes. I'm pumping gas and the gas is like, you know, nowadays it's like $2.19, for example. And I'll go, well, I know 219 times 10 is 21.19. So I'll pump till 10 gallons. I'll look at the gallon section. You ever do that before? Anybody do this? You do that? I do that many times. And I'll stop right at 10 gallons. And I'll see, should, is it 2119? Sometimes it'll say 2120 because it's the gas is $2.19.99. <laughs> you know, and I often do that. And almost 100% of the time, they're, they're well calibrated. But Jesus came into the temple and he was upset because these guys were profiteering and were cheating the people. Not only that, but they turned the house of worship and the house of prayer into a swap meet and the flea market right there in the car. And that just, oh, Jesus just became unraveled. He was self-controlled, what I don't mean by unraveled, but he was upset. He protested for the right reason, for the right reason. He didn't use that protest or that situation to protest against anything else, such as the rampant Jewish nationalism that existed or the Roman occupation, the occupiers. He didn't protest against those things. He protested for the right reason. Number three, I want to talk about ulterior motives for a little bit. Can someone have another agenda other than the real purpose for the protest? Are you seeing that today? The peaceful protests that are going, I've seen videos, you've probably seen them. I wish I could show them to you here. I've seen videos of whites, whites spray painting BLM, George Floyd, BLM on buildings with black spray paint, white people. And I've seen these videos, they're on Instagram, they're all over the place where you'll see black folk telling them, no, don't do that because they're going to blame us for this. You seen those videos? Raise your hand if you've seen those videos. You seen those videos? Or this one where these two white guys are trying to bull down, tear down these, it's at night, tear down these, I don't remember what city it was, tear down these barriers that the police set up, but the police are standing right there. And this one black girl 
is trying to discourage them from doing that because they're going to blame us. And they're going to kill us. And you know what the response was? Well, they're going to kill you anyways. That's what the response was from one of those white guys in the masks. Who knows if they were Antifa or not? It's kind of hard to you know, pinpoint them down. But can you usurp a protest and take advantage because you have another agenda? Well, we saw that in these protests. Some of them were broke into the Fashion Square Mall and breaking the windows. And I've seen those videos where uh, black leaders are saying, this is wrong because that's not going to get us anywhere. So I'm not saying that blacks were not involved because you saw those videos where blacks did go into that pawn shop you know, and kill the, the black uh, uh, retired uh, uh, captain there. You've seen those. Huh? So it's, 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 it's all a mixture. But you can protest for ulterior motives. And this is where I'm going to bring Acts 19 into play, as I mentioned earlier. The Ephesian businessmen protested against Paul. Why did they protest against Paul? Because Paul was cutting into their business. It was about money, as it usually is. It was about money. They were defending their, they were not so much defending their religious practices, but because they were losing the money, as Bruce correctly pointed out. But what was their, that was their real motive, but what did they pretend to say in that almost riotous mob that day in Ephesus? What were they saying, though, to the public? Uh, they were saying that, yeah, Diana. Oh, Diana, Diana, our goddess Diana, what's going to happen to her? What's going to happen to the temple? Like, b putting all this pretended religious garb and concern about our goddess. That's a bunch of baloney. That was a lie. You're just concerned because you're going to lose money and you're going to become unemployed and you're going to have to go file for unemployment. That's what their <laughs> so that's what their real protest was. But they just had ulterior motives. Revelation chapter 12. I'm not going to go deeply into this, but Lucifer's protest in heaven was not so much about the supposed unfairness and repression by God towards all heavenly beings. Now you have to read very carefully, and this is where you use some Hebrew tools, and this will help you to understand that in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Ezekiel 28, the text says there that the king of Tyre, now by the time, you know, that chapter 28 talks about king of Tyre, and it, it, it talks about the literal king of Tyre, which was north of Israel, and then it goes into the spiritual king of Tyre, which we understand to be description of Satan. And it says there, talking about his trade, when it's talking about the spiritual king of Tyre, T-Y-R-E, talks about his trade, his corruption because of his trade. If you look at that Hebrew term there, it's a very interesting term because it has to do with gossip, malicious spreading of lies. And all, the Seventh-day Adventist church understanding of the great controversy between Christ and Satan is that Lucifer protested God's supposed um, monarchy and uh, tyranny and not allowing the heavenly angels to have absolute freedom. Um, you know, they didn't lead God's laws after all because they were perfect beings. So why did they need God's laws? All of this gossip and this, and this fraudulent lies about God's character, that was Satan's protest in heaven until it finally ended in all-out war and that's where Revelation 12 comes into play about the war in heaven. But his real motive was not fairness for everybody, was not equality. His real motive, the Bible says, he wanted the throne. He wanted the throne. He still wants the throne. He still wants to be thrown in our hearts today. That's what we call sin, the sinful nature. Um, Daniel chapter 6, I mentioned this text. The palace high officials were not concerned for the king's reputation. Remember they said, king, why didn't you make a law for 30 days? We want you, O king, to be the head honcho. 
We want, after all, it's, it's just, we want you, Key, to be respected and to be loved by all the people. And so why don't you make a law stating that nobody is to pray to any of the other God or nothing except to you, King? Because after all, hey, you're the best. I mean, we're just so blessed. Thank the gods that you're here and that you are our king. I mean, they just buttered him up. They appealed to his ego. And that's what they said. What was their ulterior motive? What did they really want to do, according to Daniel 6? They were green with envy against Daniel, against impeccable Daniel, this foreigner, this captive of another race who climbed the ladder of success and position rapidly ahead of them. Here's a guy, another race, from another country, and he's ahead of us. We got shortchanged. They were jealous. And so they protested and packaged it one way, but underneath, they were really after something else. Just like we've seen on the news. These people that are really not for BLM, they just want to go and get these $300 Nike shoes out of the Fashion Square Mall. Just want to graffiti and do this. If you really want to protest for the right reasons, and if you really want to defend the African American race, then do it in the right way. Do it in a respectful way. Talk to the blacks themselves and ask them, what would you have us do? Because after all, this is about you guys and justice and racial equality for you, right? And usurping it to vandalize and to set a policeman on fire. Did any of you see that video? It's happened in Guadalajara, Mexico. This policeman was on his motorcycle. He's getting on his motorcycle and two guys are quickly, there's a mob all around them, quickly. A water bottle full of flammable fluid, just psh, psh, lit the policeman on fire. Luckily, the other policeman tackled him, and you know they, they put out the fire. Come on. I, would, I think Martin Luther King Jr. is turning in his grave because of this, some of the things that are being done today. I'm going to get to that. Number And here's another point that I have. Start at the right place. Now, this one is not always successful. I get it. But start at the right place. In other words, take your protest to the one who needs to hear it the most. To the oppressor. To the person or organization responsible for the injustice. To the guilty one. And this is where I bring up Matthew chapter 18. Jesus says, if you see somebody sinning, wrongdoing, what does Jesus say? Go to him or her. Go to that person. Don't start doing other things. No, go to that person. Now, what we're seeing here is more than just the person. It's a whole organization. It's, it's an establishment. And so it's a little bit more complex. But I think the principle holds true. Go to that person. This can be done in person if possible or in writing. Um, I've written a few emails this week myself. But using the right channels... Uh, you know, go to the right person. It's not always going to work. You can be dismissed continually until frustration, discouragement, and even anger sets in. I think that's the plight of many people today, where people are just not listened to. You're not listened to. You're not listened to. You're not listened to. And as human nature goes, you're going to get angry. You're going to get upset. And you're going to start doing things of a violent nature. Um, I think we can understand the frustration I wouldn't excuse violence, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's been like this for years. When are people going to listen? When are things going to change? So you can understand how some people can get upset. Think about arguments with your own spouse. Some of you may not have spouses anymore because of divisive nature of the relationship. Think about those arguments. They go both ways. He never listens to me. I'm so fed up. She never listens to me. I'm so fed up. And when that fed up is just becoming more and more and more and more, if you don't deal with things constructively, you're going to lash out and say and do things that you're going to regret. It's hard to put a cap on those things. I understand that. 
I got this quote. I didn't. I forgot to put the source. Quote: When people feel helpless, like there is nothing left to lose, like their lives already hang in the balance, a wild, swirling, undirected rage is a logical result. I did put it. The New York Times columnist Charles Blow said, "Quote: You destroy people's prospect. You destroy people's prospects. They'll destroy your property." Well, that's what some people are doing. But again, we have to be careful not to bunch everyone in the same basket and say all whites are like this or all blacks are like this. They're all doing this. They're all doing that. You have to be careful. And when emotions are so high and so charged as we are seeing today, it can easily get out of hand. That's why I mentioned that story in Acts chapter 19 in Ephesus. Things were just about to get out of hand. Some people were yelling one thing, other people were yelling another thing in the theater. Hundreds of people, and there was a riot just about to start. And some wise person said, "Let's be careful, because if what these apostles, if these guys, of what they're saying is true, then you know it's true." But if what they're saying is false, then don't worry about your business. Some wise words. And number five, this is the last one, never use your protest, your disagreement for harming others or property, nonviolence. Mahatma Gandhi protested against English occupation, against the injustices in his day. Later came Martin Luther King Jr., who was inspired by Gandhi. And you've seen those peaceful marches in the streets. Of course, there were protests and burnings being built when Martin Luther King was assassinated, and people were angry because of that. But Martin Luther King Jr. emphasized Peaceful protests. Peaceful protests. I saw video, original video footage from the 60s of people being interviewed and this young uh, black family, these young kids in this black family and the reporter goes and interviews them. And I think Dan Rather is in this, or one of those famous reporters back in the 60s. Amazing the things that were said. I downloaded like three or four Martin Luther King Jr. videos of his speeches. In one of those speeches, in fact, it's this famous speech, I can't remember what it was called, where he says, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. That famous speech. I don't remember the title of that speech, but in that same speech, I have a dream. In that same speech, I'm, I, I think I'm correct, in that same speech, he says, resulting in a huge applause, he says that black supremacy is just as dangerous as white supremacy. Which is just as dangerous as Filipino supremacy, Mexican-American supremacy, Mexican supremacy, uh, Latin American supremacy, Iraqi supremacy. Any type of race supremacy over another is a dangerous one. That's what Martin Luther King Jr. espoused. Nonviolence. That was his philosophy and practice. The greatest protest, I want to finish on a spiritual note now. What is the greatest protest we need to be engaged in today? The greatest protest we need to be engaged in today. I want to share with you my heartfelt thoughts on this one. It's against hatred prejudice and indifference. We have to protest against those tendencies in the human heart. That's the greatest protest. We humans are the best practitioners with years of experience and expertise, as I pointed out this morning, of seeing each other as our own enemies. Humans against humans. Humans of one race see humans of another race as inferior or as dangerous or as animals because of the differentness between races and cultures it is probably rare that no race is not 
guilty of this. I think we can all agree, all of us agree, that what we saw on that very sad day, that day that expresses, I can't breathe with the knee against the neck. I think we can all agree that that was unjust, that the uh, murder sentence is correct. I think we can agree with that. But our tendency as human beings, we always, always go too far in one sense or another. And this is what I mean. You cannot say that all African Americans or all Latinos or all white trash, trailer trash, what they call, I'm using culture terms, are evil or criminals. You can't say that. Neither can you say that all police, that all police officers or what they're saying, the acronym ACAB, all cops are bastards. That's what some of the graffiti that you'll find here or there. You can't say that. Not all cops are racists or are evil. You can't say that. And that is the concern that I have. The systemic racism against certain races, in this context, African-Americans. But you cannot go too far on the other end and say, all cops are evil. All cops are bad. There's a lot of good cops out there. I would say the majority of them are good cops. It's true that reformation needs to take place in the police community. It's true that the police unions probably protect too much the bad cops in the system, and that needs to be reformed. That's true. But the protest that we need to be engaged in is we need to fight against our human tendency to not love others. And this is what Jesus warned us about in the last days. He said, because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many, in some manuscripts it says most, will grow what? Cold. Of all of these things that are, we are seeing, it's going to be easy to give up and to be disgusted, and I wish I was a hermit, I'm disgusted with people, we have to fight against that. And we have to fight the good fight and say we need to love people. We need to see all people as equal in God's eyes. Last week I said all lives matter. And some people may cringe at that because that's a politically charged statement. But I said it in the context of what Jesus says. There's no Jew, there's no Gentile, there's no female or male, no this race or that race, no free or slave. All are one in Jesus Christ. We, as humanity, we have to maintain sanity in our sights and in our hearts and not to lash out against other human beings Bunching them all in the same basket. We have to love others. And I'm going to go a step farther because Jesus goes a step farther. And this is going to go against the grain, especially of what is we are seeing today. The only solution for this madness that we're seeing today is Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he goes farther. He says, love your enemies. So my message, my message is that whites need to love black people. My message is that blacks need to love white people. My message is that who cares whether you're black 
or Latin or white. Who cares? We need to love others. And when others do us wrong, Jesus says we need to love our enemies. We need to love our enemies. The foundational protest we should be engaged in is the one against the primitive, base, animalistic virus that exists in the human heart that I'm better than you. That's the number one protest. The Bible says it correctly. There are battles against flesh and blood. That's true. But the real battle, the Bible says, is not against flesh and blood. It's against spiritualities. It's against those spiritual powers, the dark forces that are unseen, that subtly and cunningly enter our psyches, our thoughts, and our hearts, and will pit us against another human being. That has got to stop. In the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of sanity, we need to learn how to love each other simply because you're a human being. And to say to the Floyd family, love those who killed your brother, your nephew, your son. Do you know how many millions, if I were to post that in social media, I would be massacred to say something like that. Would you agree? I would be massacred. But I'm not saying it. Jesus is saying to those bad cops out there, you got to change your ways and you got to love others. And Jesus is saying to those crips and those bloods, I grew up in L.A. I grew up in L.A. Not too far from central, L, uh, you know, Inglewood and Watts and Compton. Jesus would probably say to the crips, you got to love the bloods because they're human beings. He'd say to the Bloods the same thing. He would say to those hundreds of Latino gangs in LA, you gotta love each other. Even though you consider them your, your enemy, you gotta love each other. Even in my own subculture, Mexican Americans have prejudice against the Mexican culture from Mexico. You may not believe it, but that's the truth. And vice versa. The same message of Scripture is that God loves people. Jesus died for everyone. He died for George Floyd. He died for, what's his name? You told me his name this morning. The cop that killed him. Derek Chavon. Jesus died for Derek Chavon. How many of you agree with that? How many of you agree that Jesus died for George Floyd? How many of you agree that Jesus died for those who looted the, the mall in Scottsdale, those that broke the windows. You think Jesus died for them? Jesus died for them too. He loves them. You think Jesus died for the organizers of, of Black Lives Matter? Yes. Jesus died for everyone so that we can all come together in unity in the name of love. We may disagree on points. That's always going to happen. But it's insanity that humans are against humans. That's not the way God meant it to be. This is the main protest. The protest against the sinful nature to put self first and to pit my race above your race. My ways above your ways. American ways above Mexican ways. Mexican ways above American ways. German ways above Italian ways. Spanish ways above Portuguese ways, Portugal ways. When I was in the seminary back in the early 90s, I experienced prejudice. We remember this very well. We experienced prejudice. It wasn't against Mexican Americans against Mexican Americans or other races. I was really shocked by this. We experienced prejudice from African Americans against African Africans. The same that I said earlier. 
Mexican Americans that grew up in this culture, like me, I am Americanized Latino, the same prejudice they have against those straight out of Mexico. Those racisms exist within the same race. Can't have this. Whites against whites. Whites killing whites. In the Civil War, we saw that. The Civil War wasn't all black soldiers fighting against all white soldiers. There were white soldiers killing other white soldiers because they disagreed over slavery. Rwandan genocide, the same thing. Hutus murdered between 500,000 and a million Tutsis. Rwandans killing Rwandans. Bosnians killing Bosnians, the ethnic cleansing of Muslims from 1992 to 1995 when Serb military forces massacred thousands. Insanity. The only sanity in this world is the message of the love of God for the human race and to love our neighbor as ourself. Jesus crossed the boundaries when he gave that parable to the Jews, to the Jewish crowd that day that there was this man that showed compassion on a man that was half dead and beaten and robbed on the road. And one of you Jewish people, a Levite and a priest saw him and passed by on the other road. The Jewish crossed the, Jesus crossed the line by saying this. The man that helped that man was a Samaritan. These hybrid monsters and Jesus lifted up this foreigner, this Samaritan that said he was the one that was the true neighbor. Those are fighting words in Jewish for Jewish ears. This ludicrousy that we see of racism and prejudice, all human beings, all human beings are equal in God's eyes. Jesus died for all people, all people even the ones that you don't like, even the ones that you and I may hate, Jesus loves them. That's the only sane message in our world today. And the protest that we need to do is a positive one. The protest against the hatred that exists in the human heart and promote love for humanity. That's what we need to be engaged in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word for the light and the sanity and the power and the truth that your word gives to us. Help us not to forget this. In these times where anger and disgust and violence, same thing in Noah's day. In these days, God, Help us not to lose our spiritual moorings, to be firmly planted in the gospel of truth, the gospel of love. God, we want you to be in our hearts, that your love will be the light of our lives. And help us to love others as you have loved us. Help us to forgive others as you have forgiven my own sins. Help us to minister to others, regardless of looks, appearance, race, as you minister to us, Jesus. Help us to reflect you in this crazy world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.